So our next speaker is Dr. Diaz. Uh, as you may know, he's a Canadian neurosurgeon scientist and neurosurgical oncology specialist. He graduated from the University of Toronto Medical School in 2007 and completed residency, is, uh, sorry, completed residency at the University of Calgary in 2015. Concurrent to his residency, he earned a PhD degree in 2013 from the University of Toronto for research performed under the supervision of Dr. James Rudka at the Hospital for Sick Children Brain Tumor Research Center. After achieving certification in neurosurgery by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in 2015, Dr. Diaz undertook fellowship training in surgical neuro-oncology at the University of Miami under the mentorship of Dr. Ricardo Comotar. Dr. Diaz is currently in active practice here at the Neuro and is an assistant professor of neuro neurology and neurosurgery at McGill University. So please uh, welcome Dr. Diaz. Thank you. thank you, Maurice, for that uh, kind welcome, and thank you to everyone here today um, for signing up and, and coming to this. Uh, I know you all have very busy practices uh, and lives, so um, the goal for today was to try to uh, update everyone on some new developments in, in the field of uh, gliomas, uh, and specifically looking at uh, Kind of one, what are the key factors for early diagnosis uh, for the practitioners in, in the community, as well as some of the new kind of molecular markers that are coming up and are playing more important roles in, in prognosis in patients with gliomas. Um, so it's it's kind of a broad overview, and I've I've tried to really focus it on the general practitioner as opposed to focusing on neurosurgical details. Um, so overall, the, the objectives of the talk are to understand the clinical presentation, imaging features, and natural history of gliomas, understand how the new classification of gliomas, which was uh, just uh, introduced in 2016, impacts on treatment and prognosis, and to develop an appreciation of the role of surgery and adjuvant therapy in glioma treatment. So to begin with, uh, it's important to just state that malignant brain tumors and gliomas in general are very rare. Uh, and so, in the general practitioner practice, uh, the top three here, breast, prostate, and colon, and, and, and lung as well, will be the most common tumors uh, that you'll, you'll have in, in, in your patient population. Um, overall, if we look at the U.S. data, we uh, unfortunately don't have uh, Canadian data yet, uh, but the Canadian Brain Tumor Foundation is working to uh, try to get that going in terms of collecting uh, more statistics for the incidence of brain tumors across the country. Um, but with American data, we can safely uh, estimate about seven uh, per 100,000 new uh, cases of glioblastoma, which is the grade four, WHO grade four glioma um, per year. So that's uh, about 140 cases a year in Montreal, if we just say a two million population in Montreal. So it's, that's not insignificant, but still it's quite, it's quite a rare diagnosis. Uh, and so a lot of the symptoms that patients present with are, can be uh, taken uh, to be caused by other conditions, other medical conditions, whether it be uh, cardiac, um, psychiatric uh, disease. Um, headache is a very uh, prevalent in the population in general, but uh, the percentage of patients with headache that actually have a brain tumor is very small. Um, this uh, paper from Scandinavia, from Finland, actually looked at um, 140 patients that were admitted uh, to a private hospital, um, and they uh, tried to address what the presenting symptoms were, and so they just uh, tallied up all the different presenting symptoms in, the, in this patient population that was quite broad, included patients with uh, grade two uh, to grade four tumors. Um, and the interesting results from this study was that Headache was actually not at the top of the list, which is what we often see on tables for symptoms for brain tumors. Um, and in fact, cognitive disorders, so attention, memory, learning uh, deficits were actually much more frequent. Um, and of course, uh, seizures um, uh, in, this, in this population. Now this may be, there may be some cu cultural differences, so, you know, with a European population, they may be, uh, you know, potentially uh, more stoic uh, cultural um, kind of values in, in that population, but it's, it's a quite interesting study. Um, I tried to look to see if there were 
any similar studies in, in the North American perspective, and there weren't actually. This was one of um, only a handful of studies with, that looked at who's presenting symptoms. So it's an understudied area, uh, and certainly for the practitioner, for the general practitioner, it's very important to uh, clue into that it's not just headaches, but other things may um, be red flags for um, uh, malignant brain tumors and glomas. Uh, another interesting um, finding in the study was that uh, the presenting symptoms tended to vary depending on the age of the patient. So younger uh, patients tended to present uh, more with seizures and cognitive disorders, whereas older patients had uh, lower incidence of seizures, but higher incidence of cognitive disorders. Um, so you can see here in graph A, um, as you get older, um, there's a higher incidence of cognitive disorders. Those under 50 tended to not have as many cognitive disorders uh, when they presented. And then as you get older, the incidence of seizure drops, drops out. Furthermore, um, as you increase in the grade of the tumor, cognitive disorders tend to be more predominant, um, and seizures tend to be less predominant as you went higher in seizure grade. So a word on headache. Let's not forget headache, because of What's course... What's the matter? I have a headache. It might be a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's not a tumor at all. That always gets a laugh for some reason. Um, so brain tumor-associated headache, very important topic. Um, in atypical headaches, uh, about 14% of patients that get scanned will have an abnormality. So certainly a headache that is not the typical migraine or tension-type headache, um, it, that is persistent, that is um, not relieved with an, any of the standard medications that you would use to treat uh, tension-type or migraine headaches. Um, those should should be scanned. Those patients should be scanned, and the you know the yield is is, is not uh, terrible. However, when we get into difficulty, is when patients present with tension type headaches or migraine headaches, and you can see the yield um, uh, in terms of the MRI abnormal MRIs is quite low. So picking out those patients that have um, migraine like headache that have a brain tumor is actually quite a difficult and challenging thing for the practitioner. Um, we have to remember that headaches are, are rarely the sole presenting uh, symptom, and in fact, it's probably about 10% of patients where it's the sole presenting sy symptom. So, you know, there are a uh, long list of headaches, red flags, but these are some of the ones that um, in my practice I, I, I really have seen, and um, uh, there, was, uh, there was an article by... Um, one of our neighbors uh, from the uh, Chum Hospital who also uh, uh, wrote um, a very nice review in, in neurosurgery um, looking at uh, red flags. So this is adapted from their list, uh, but also um, with some additional uh, changes. So persistent headaches, uh, so again, um, those headaches that uh, don't seem to go away uh, occur on a daily basis. Uh, they can be tension type, and in some cases they can even be, be migraine type. Uh, headaches. Um, sudden onset, uh, I'll know the sudden onset of headache in, in terms of subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, uh, is a harbinger for subarachnoid hemorrhage, but also there can be some uh, cases where sudden onset headache may be related to just raised intracranial pressure and, uh, in a growing tumor. Um, headache that's aggravated with um, any activity that increases intracranial pressure, coughing, straining, exertion change in the character of previous headaches. So a person that had migraines, headaches that were the same for many years, but now something seems to be off, something seems different. Um, patients who uh, wake up at night um, or uh, the headache is present first thing in the morning when, when they wake up. So the headache that wakes them up in the night, very important. Um, patients with, uh, that they're coming when they, with a hemicrania, uh, lateralized headache on one side, but with no family history of headaches and no prior history of any types of headaches like that. Uh, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, and papilledema, this is kind of the, the package for uh, very important uh, signs and symptoms of raised intracranial pressure. Focal neurological deficit, and this is um, you know, the uh, brief neurological exam, uh, focused neurological exam in the clinic. Um, and then um, paying attention to things like 
my mom seems a little bit more confused. Um, she's 65, but should she be more confused now? She's been getting more confused over the last year. Is this early onset dementia? Is this something else? Um, so um, attention and memory difficulties. So we looked at that list that they were um, quite about 50% of patients had um, cognitive changes at presentation. Uh, new psychiatric symptoms in patients that have never had a psychiatric history. They, you know, they're leading their life uh, active person, and then all of a sudden they start getting depressed. They, uh, they're, they don't joke around anymore. They used to be quite lively. They're not talking as much. They're uh, very reserved. And then uh, seizure, first onset seizure in an adult um, definitely needs uh, neuroimaging to rule out uh, intracranial lesion. So um, again, just to emphasize that neurocognitive changes are frequent in patients with um, gliomas. This is a study in low-grade gliomas in patients with eloquent region tumors. So you would expect there to be more uh, cognitive changes, but look at that, 94% had uh, changes in verbal memory, um, whereas only 32% had changes in their MOCA. So even our typical screening tests, um, which we may use in the clinic, they, they may miss some things. And, um, you know, we, we try to get uh, patients who come in um, uh, to the hospital to, to be seen by our occupational therapists um, ahead of time to have uh, these screening tests done and to see if they actually have baseline uh, deficits before they undergo surgery. In another study uh, where they looked at higher glioma patients, the glioblastoma patients, GBM, um, they actually correlated survival with um, their ability uh, to um, uh, name. Uh, so the uh, COA score, COWA, is um, uh, word association. So basically you ask the patient um, to list as many words as they can in a minute, uh, starting with the letter F, A or S, and then you tally the, the scores. Um, and normal in young patients is about, it's more than 32. Um, uh, sorry, in old patients more than 32, and young patients more than 43. So there's an age cutoff of around 65. Um, and so three out of, you know, in this study, three out of five patients with GBM had impairment in learning and memory, right? So it's, it's significant. So just to summarize uh, those few slides, so uh, neurocognitive changes, um, unprovoked seizures and persistent headaches, as well as new neurological deficits should trigger investigation for intracranial tumor. Um, neurocognitive changes may be best elicited with questions regarding attention, memory, and learning. And um, our typical tests like, a, like the MOCA, the screening test may, not, may be normal despite neurocognitive changes, subtle neurocognitive changes in patients with glioma. So more detailed testing may be uh, needed. Let's move on to uh, looking at the imaging. Um, so initially in the, in the emergency department, the patient may get a CT scan of the head, which reveals um, uh, a tumor uh, mass that uh, has uh, mixed density. So there's areas of hyperdensity, hypodensity. There's mass effect. Um, here it's crossing the corpus callosum. Um, this tumor uh, then is uh, assessed by MRI. Uh, and we can see there's necrotic changes. There's a cyst in the middle of the tumor. Uh, and uh, with contrast, it enhances, but it enhances uh, heterogeneously. Um, and a very irregular uh, pattern to the enhancement. This tumor is inside the brain, so it's intraaxial, inside the parenchyma. It's not growing from outside in. Um, and typically, the <coughs> differential diagnosis here would be either a high-grade glioma or potentially a lymphoma, um, less likely a metastasis given the, the imaging finding. Typically, metastasis are well circumscribed um, as opposed to this very irregular pattern of uh, enhancement. <laughs> Low-grade gliomas look quite different. Um, so they may have some hy hypodensity. They may have calcification. This is calcification right in the middle of the tumor um, here in this uh, patient with a right frontal um, oligodendroglioma. Um, the uh, tumor on T2-weighted imaging um, may be diffuse, uh, infiltrative, and uh, hyper-intense on uh, T2-weighted imaging. Uh, and may not show much contrast enhancement on the post-gadolinium imaging. Um, so 
Um, in terms of the imaging, it's in important to uh, note that uh, abnormal hypo or hyperdensity on CT um, should go on to be assessed by MRI in patients that present in the emergency department. Um, abnormal parenchymal calcifications may also be um, a harbinger of an underlying glioma and should be assessed by a, an MRI. Um, and it's important to note that gliomas, uh, because they can present just as this hypodensity on the CT, can be confused with a stroke, especially in patients with a new acute neurological uh, deficit. Uh, and so most of those patients do undergo MRI imaging, and it's important to um, uh, keep that in the differential uh, in these patients uh, after uh, a stroke is, is ruled out um, if there's still abnormality on the CT or on the MRI. Um, any questions about the, the imaging? Anything? Uh, anyone had any, any specific questions or thoughts uh, about that? Yeah. Okay, before we go, switch gears a little bit. So the, um, over the past 20 years, there has been a, what I would term a molecular revolution in, in terms of uh, the understanding of uh, the genetics of uh, gliomas. Um, and uh, increased use of that understanding to better predict uh, survival in these in patients with gliomas. Um, one of the first studies uh, uh, was in oligodendrogliomas, um, and this was actually, this is a, a Canadian story because Dr. Karen Cross uh, and uh, Marianne, who's, who has left us, would know because she, he worked at, uh, in London. Um, first looked at uh, the loss of uh, chromosome arms 1P and 19Q in patients with oligodendrogliomas. And they were able to correlate in this early study with few patients. They were able to show that patients that had loss of both chromosome arms, 1P and 19Q, had a much lower risk of death uh, over long term after they were treated with chemotherapy and radiation. Um, so this was the very first study that indicated that you know, maybe looking into these chromosomal changes in these tumors um, may be uh, an indication of how these tumors were going to respond to radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, the follow-up uh, larger trial to this was in 291 patients. It was a randomized control trial where patients were randomized to receive radiation or radiation <coughs> and PCV chemotherapy. Um, and the patients, uh, in, in both groups, uh, whether it be the radiation and chemotherapy or the radiation alone, if they had the 1P19Q uh, deletion, uh, had a longer survival. So in the radiation and chemotherapy group, 14.7 year uh, median overall sur survival versus 7.3 years. And in the radiation therapy group, 7.3 versus 2.7 years. Um, this study also uh, showed the benefit of using combined radiation and chemotherapy for, for these patients. Uh, with anaplastic oligodendrogliomas. Uh, in terms of uh, glioblastoma, um, we've had uh, uh, increased success in uh, achieving long-term survival with combined radiation and chemotherapy. And the initial study was uh, not in 2009, but in 2005. Uh, that was published by, by Stoop. Um, this is the five-year outcome uh, data from that original study, again, showing that there is a tail to these patients that are treated with combined radiation and chemotherapy. So about 10% of patients may have prolonged survival greater than three years. Um, so this is, this is quite an achievement compared to what, was, what patients received previously, which was just radiation with a median survival of about nine to 12 months. Um, uh, extending on this work was uh, Dr. Hege, um, who looked at uh, another uh, molecular marker of uh, prognosis, which is MGMT promoter methylation. On the next slide, I'll describe what this, this means, but this, what they found in this study was that those patients with MGMT promoter methylation actually had the best uh, survival outcome when they were treated with radiation and chemotherapy. Um, and, uh, and, and even, even in uh, uh, patients that receive the same treatment um, with chemotherapy and radiation, the MGMT promoter methylation was a, a key driver of, of prognosis. So that's the difference between the orange line here 
and the teal colored line. So how does MGMT promoter methylation work? Um, this, is a, this is a Mac, uh, <laughs> Mac uh, problem. <laughs> so um, what, uh, we'll be able to provide the, the slides, I think, uh, and since you, you can see them. So um, the timazolamide TMZ targets uh, uh, the guanosine uh, residues on DNA and it adds a methyl group um, to guanine. Um, when it forms, and that forms the O6 methyl guanine. So what ends up happening is that usually G, uh, which pairs with C, instead pairs with T. And when the DNA repair uh, mechanisms recognize that mismatch, um, they cause a break in the DNA. And then if the cell undergoes two replication cycles, the DNA repair mechanisms eventually clue into the fact that this is wrong and the, c the cell should die. Um, so you actually need two replication cycles after the treatment with TMZ for the cell to die uh, in the end because it has to go through this DNA repair process. In patients that have uh, methylated uh, MGMT, that means the promoter region of that gene is methylated, it shuts off the gene. Uh, production, so that's a stop sign, big stop sign for gene pro for the gene production. So they're not able to repair that methyl group that's placed on on the guanosine, and um, and therefore they undergo this cell death process. In patients that do not have the promoter methylation, those are the ones that have a poor prognosis with radiation and, and temozolomide chemotherapy because. <laughs> the tumor cells are able to repair um, this methyl group and they go on and they replicate with uh, no issues. They don't undergo this DNA uh, repair and they don't undergo cell death. The next uh, big player in terms of genomics of glioma was the IDH1 mutation that was identified around 2010. And uh, in this study, they, they looked at um, this mutation in a, um, a whole series of tumors and found that uh, low-grade gliomas, uh, about 70% of low-grade gliomas or higher, um, had mutations in IDH1 or IDH2. Uh, IDH1, IDH2 are isocitrate dehydrogenase uh, genes. Um, they're important in the conversion of isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate. When these are mutated, they gain a uh, new function. And what they do is they take alpha-ketoglutarate and they convert it to 2-hydroxyglutarate. Uh, basically, they add a hydrogen right here to this oxygen. And that's, that's really the only difference. And that small molecular difference to produce 2-hydroxyglutarate results in a whole slew of cascading events in the cell that uh, results in reprogramming of metabolism and how the cell uses glucose, and reprogramming of the DNA by epigenetic changes and methylation of the DNA. So when we look at uh, patients with uh, IDH1 mutation and MGMT methylation, we see that there's um, a prolonged survival in patients with low-grade glioma that have both the IDH1 mutation and the MGMT uh, methylation. Uh, this was a series of 55 patients in Japan um, with very long um, uh, follow-up, 52 months. And these were, in fact, independent predictors of survival when they um, ran their multivariate analysis. A similar thing is observed uh, when we look at anaplastic uh, glioma, uh, and uh, we looked at the difference between uh, survival in patients with anaplastic gliomas that have IDH1 mutation versus uh, wild type. So you can see with the IDH1 mutation in green versus the orange um, here, so much improved survival in those patients with the IDH1 mutation. And you can see the 1P19Q co-deleted anaplastic oligodendrogliomas have the best survival at the top there. And <laughs> We also see the effects of IDH1 mutation and, and MGMT methylation status in patients with glioblastoma. Unfortunately, only about 14% of patients with uh, glioblastoma 
um, are uh, mutated in IDH1 and also have um, VIN T methylation. So these patients, which are the long surviving uh, patients, are rare, but they do occur. Um, and so these, uh, because of this knowledge, we, it, it really changes how we discuss uh, prognosis with, with patients. And um, you can see how these molecular markers, which are now be, being tested routinely in the clinical setting, um, are really important uh, in the patient discussion. Uh, and in fact, now when patients ask me uh, about prognosis in that first initial meeting, um, I have to just take a step back and say, we don't know. We'll know a lot more once we have the pathology results and the molecular markers back. Um, uh, because I think, I think it just giving them uh, an, a general number in terms of the aggregated population, it really does a disservice to patients that may end up having quite fa favorable molecular diagnosis um, and then prognosis. Um, the WHO, which um, publishes the classification system of gliomas, um, just updated their classification system last year uh, based on the new molecular understanding of the tumors. Uh, and this is just to show um, the, that it's becoming a lot more complicated um, than our uh, histological diagnosis in the past. So in the past, we just looked at whether these were astrocytic or oligodendroglial tumors, whether they were grade two, three, or four. Um, but now we, we have to include uh, an analysis of the IDH status, uh, APRX uh, status, the 1P19Q status, and uh, what's not included here, which is the MGMT promoter methylation, which is also uh, important for as a prognostic marker. So uh, what about the role of surgery? Is surgery still important for prognosis in these, in these tumors? And um, uh, the, the growing, um, growing uh, data suggests that it is. Um, we still don't have a uh, randomized control trial for this, and I, we never will um, because, because of ethical uh, reasons. Um, but one of the closest studies that really gets us to, to answering the question um, was this study by Stumer in 2008. Uh, and in fact, they, they, they didn't start by looking at differences in, in terms of extent of resection and, and survival, but what they were looking at was using a fluorescent marker to tag uh, glioblastomas during surgery in order to increase the extent of resection. So they had two groups. They had a white light resection group and a fluorescent resection group, and then they compared the outcomes. And they found that uh, using the fluorescent marker, they were able to remove more tumor, and it seemed that those patients uh, that had, that were in the fluorescent group that had more tumor resection had a, lar a longer progression-free survival. When they reanalyzed the data and looked, uh, separated the patients into those patients that had complete resection, regardless of whether they had white light or fluorescent surgery, and those that had inc incomplete resection, they were able to show a significant survival benefit in those patients with uh, complete resection. So I think this was, and this was a randomized study, so this, this is one of the best evidence that, that we have in terms of uh, extent of resection. Now, um, lower quality uh, data in terms of prospective or retrospective studies, um, we do have a lot of evidence uh, from those, and uh, he, here's one of them uh, with, with over 100 uh, patients with um, over the age of 65 that have different types of surgical intervention, either biopsy, gross total resection, GTR, or subtotal resection. And you can see those patients that had gross total resection had a, a, a longer uh, median overall survival. Um, and um, this is one of the largest studies. This is over 1,000 patients in this study uh, comparing patients that had 100% resection of the tumor, of the enhancing tumor. Uh, compared to those that had le less than 100% resection, but more than 78% resection. Um, so these were, weren't just patients that were biopsy. These were patients that had surgery, but maybe there was about 20% residual. Um, and uh, even, even that small increase in the extent of resection resulted in a significant uh, improvement in, in survival. 
Uh, is there a role for resection um, when glioblastoma recurs? So if patients undergo um, full, uh, complete resection, they have uh, radiation chemotherapy, and then they have a recurrence. Um, should we go back in and operate again, offer a second line uh, chemotherapy agent? Um, this study, uh, which was a meta-analysis of all the published trials looking at resection at, at time of recurrence, showed a slight increase in survival, uh, overall survival from the time of diagnosis with surgery. And uh, the three factors that they found to be si significantly correlating with uh, survival in this case was young age, good performance status, and ability to res achieve a gross total resection again at the time of recurrence. Another study uh, that uh, looked at this uh, question as well, complete versus incomplete resection at the time of recurrence, showed that those patients with complete resection at the time of recurrence had a longer uh, uh, survival. Um, so what these tell us is that really at the time of recurrence, um, if we're able to achieve a complete resection uh, safely, that uh, it does significantly improve uh, survival uh, in, in these patients. And, um, these patients should, should be evaluated and, and assessed to see if they would uh, meet criteria for a second surgery. So overall, new, the new classification of gliomas is based on a histological and molecular diagnosis as of 2016. IDH1 mutation, MGMT promoter methylation, and 1P19 trucodilation are important prognostic markers, and surgical resection plays an important role in multimodality therapy for glioma. I wanted to just show you some of the um, new kind of bells and whistles that we're using in, in surgery and some of the up and coming uh, technologies that uh, may be important players in the future in glioma therapy. So awake craniotomy, which um, was pioneered uh, here at the, at the neuro, has been around a long time and so we, we've used that uh, to our advantage uh, to resect uh, tumors that are in very eloquent regions. This is just showing a tumor that's uh, right in front of the uh, face uh, motor area um, and uh, kind of just exposed just between face motor and the speech area. So this was a tumor here that was resected uh, by awake craniotomy and using multimodality navigation, um, using a na navigation system like a GPS system uh, for the brain uh, and overlying fMRI data on top of that in order to localize uh, the face area as well as the speech area. Uh, we can use uh, fluorescent surgery, so this is using fluorescein, which has been used a long time for surgery uh, in the retina, uh, but now it's being applied to uh, glioblastoma. And this is a patient uh, that's being operated. You can see the uh, surgical uh, field, and uh, the uh, bolus of fluorescein is injected into the veins, and then it builds up over time in the tumor so that the surgeon can resect just what, what glows green. Uh, and avoid all the, everything that doesn't glow, glow green. Um, we talked about the Stumer study, which uh, used a different type of uh, fluorescent marker. This was 5-ALA, uh, and they demonstrated a significant improvement in gross total resection using uh, fluorescence, 5-ALA uh, fl fluorescence. And uh, the new thing that's uh, on the block now is uh, laser ablation. Uh, so I, I think um, this is uh, certainly it's been in the news um, and I've had a number of patients asking about it uh, at the time of diagnosis whether these tumors can be treated with laser. At the moment it's an experimental therapy uh, still, although the actual system to do the, the treatment, the laser treatments has been approved by the FDA um, for lesioning in the brain, uh, but not specifically for brain tumor surgery. Um, the centers that have uh, trialed these uh, have been on uh, inop what previously had been considered inoperable gliomas, for example, gliomas in the thalamus. Um, and the way it works is uh, we basically make a small hole in the skull and we use the navigation system to place a catheter that's about three millimeters in, in diameter into the center of the tumor. At the tip of the catheter, there's, there's a, a light emitting uh, laser, uh, which heats up the tissue from the inside out. And the heating uh, procedure is done uh, in the MRI suite uh, using a special sequence that allows us to measure the temperature in the brain. 
using just the MRI signal. So as it's heated, we can see the heating and we can uh, plot out the damage estimate uh, based on the heating uh, multiplied by the time uh, interval. Uh, and this is just a heating of one of the uh, gliomas that we treated in Miami um, in, in the scanner, and you can see the damage estimate of the area that's being ablated or cooked from the inside out of the tumor. This is one of the patients uh, that uh, we treated in Miami um, where uh, she had a recurrent uh, small uh, glioblastoma. Uh, you can see the catheter here. This is uh, in during the treatment that we get the scan. Um, and you can see the, the enhancement has changed afterwards. So that tells us that the, there's been complete ablation of the lesion afterwards. Uh, this is the series that was published. Um, this is the um, uh, collection of patients actually from the major centers in the states that are um, trialing uh, laser ablation. So you can see there's not many patients uh, at the moment, there's about 25 patients that are being treated, and this is from the first published series that came out in December of uh, last year. Uh, the very promising thing was that these patients seem to have quite a prolonged uh, overall survival compared to historical controls in patients where, where there was just biopsy and then radiation and chemotherapy given. Um, so this is early days, um, but it's a uh, very interesting and, and promising surgery, uh, new surgery, and um, hopefully we can uh, start to um, introduce it and use it in, in Canada as well for not only for glioblastomas but for other types of tumors. Um, so in summary, gliomas are rare but constitute a life-changing diagnosis. Cognitive changes and seizures are more frequent presenting signs than, than headache <laughs> in recent, uh, some of the studies uh, in the literature. The molecular classification is improving our ability to predict the response to therapy, and res extent of resection is associated with survival at diagnosis and at recurrence. Multimodality surgical tools are improving our ability to remove these tumors uh, and to extend survival. Thank you for your attention today, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.